mentioned uh, who I am with Rutland Union Ink Company. We're located here in Pineville, North Carolina. Those of you familiar with Rutland and Union, we've been in business many years, uh, over 80 years with Union, over 50 years with Rutland. Uh, we purchased Rutland Group, the ownership of Rutland, purchased the Union Ink Company in 2005. And uh, through, through time now, over 10 years, we've been slowly sort of rolling the companies together by location, but still working very hard to keep the companies uh, differentiated by brands. So we still make Union Ink like Union Ink's always been made in the Union Ink line and it's Union Ink's formulas. And then we make Rutland Ink in the same plant, um, the way Rutland Ink has always been made. Uh, but we are owned by the same group. We are now one operation. We relocated the New Jersey facility um, January, January of uh, 14, we'll call it, sort of the end of 13 into, 15, into 14. Uh, rolled it all into one uh, group. Um, I myself am a screen printer. I started in 89, so I think I've trumped the room here. Um, but uh, pulling squeegee in a guy's garage, and through the years I've worked uh, at different levels of screen printing, um, you know, from manual printing to reclaiming screens to ultimately running facilities. The company that I left is still a large customer for our business today. Um, about 60 automatics all in. So I got the opportunity to help that business grow through the years. And, uh, and then that company got big enough to the point where I, quite frankly, what, it wasn't what I wanted to do anymore. So I uh, signed on with Rutland about nine years ago, and I haven't looked back. I've enjoyed it. But again, I also enjoy this interaction and the training aspect. So we're here today to talk about embroidery. And I hope you're, no, we're here today to talk about uh, silicone. And it's exciting to bring this new technology to you. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned, we're going to talk about the, the pros, the cons, the benefits, how it's priced, how to print it, um, what problems it may solve. We're going to cover all of that in what I think is two hours allotted, right? We, we've scheduled to be done here at noon. Is that, is that correct understanding, Dwayne? Yeah, so we better get going. Um, so how did we get here with silicone ink? Um, I can tell you that uh, many years ago in my former life, we were a, a jersey converter, which means the Green Bay Packers jerseys would be shipped to my plant in Norfolk, Virginia uh, with printing on the sleeves. Uh, my company would then convert those jerseys to the, the, the top or key players of that period. So a lot of times we, the Packers know they're going to print Aaron Rodgers jerseys. They know they're going to print Jordy Nelson's jerseys. But what they don't know is that Cobb may have a great stretch of receiving for a lot of yards, and there's a huge demand for Cobb jerseys. So my company's responsibility was converting those jerseys designated to the Green Bay Packers, but the player sort of of the week, we would convert and produce mass quantities of those jerseys. We noticed as those jerseys came in from Asia, which is where they're assembled, uh, that a lot of the sleeves had this foreign material on them that we didn't, couldn't quite identify what it was. We knew it was stretchy, we knew it was flexible, we knew it was cool, but we didn't know exactly what it was. So we started the process of researching what's going on with these sleeves. What we learned was, in Asia, they were applying silicone to sleeves. So silicone being used for textile decoration is not new, uh, at least not new to Asia, to the Western Hemisphere it's new. In the Western Hemisphere, as you look at the map and sort of go up and down from South America up to North America, we pretty much print in the same process here through automated printing, manual printing. Very little table printing is done like in Asia. If you Google table screen printing, you'll see videos of guys with screens that they pick up and swipe and move, pick up and swipe and move, pick up and swipe and move all day long miles long of tables putting decorations down. Some of them even have a pull cord with a flash cure unit where they're swiping and moving and pulling the flash to the next one. It's an amazing process. Um, that process worked well for silicone printing because that process doesn't require um, quick flashing so that you can put the next layer down. So what changed and what helped us as Western Hemisphere printers be able to use silicone ink to decorate is that chemistry allowed us to sort of enhance the product um, and decorate with a, a quicker flash time so that it was a suitable material for us to use for our Western Hemisphere style of printing. So that's my opinion of how it evolved. I don't know that any one guy is a resource who could 
say for sure that's the fact, but in my experience going back 15 years ago or so when I started the research, we could not really find a viable option for textile automated printing for silicone ink. It just didn't, it just wasn't out there. In parallel, what happened is that as we're all aware, cotton prices really started spiking. Uh, poly, polyester started becoming more and more predominant in our business, really to sort of offset some of the inflated prices on cotton. And we start seeing polyester show up uh, on apparel. And for all of us, years of printing nylon and cotton, life was good because those materials generally were color fast. Dye migration was something that we could opt out of. We could just say, yeah, you know what, we want that jersey, but we want it in a nylon. We don't want it in a polyester. Now it's, it's rare to find nylon jerseys come through your facility. They don't really exist like they used to um, 10, 15 years ago. So now we're all challenged to print on polyester substrates. Good news about polyester substrates is polyester substrates are fairly easy to print is when it comes to the applying of the ink. They're smooth, they're slick, they're not, they're not really absorbent, so the ink likes to lay on the surface. So generally speaking, you can apply a nice vibrant print on polyester. The challenge is polyester has got this problem that we're all aware of, right? Probably one of the reasons why you may be here. And that is that polyester releases dye. Unlike nylon and unlike cotton, when polyester is heated and ran through an oven, it's going to release dye in a gas. You and I as professional garment decorators don't have the advantage to know exactly what temperature this is going to release the dye. What we know is that somewhere between 220 probably and 340 degrees, it's going to release dye. That window is a ridiculous window to try to select the right ink chemistry to mitigate dye migration. So now we're challenged to figure out how do we keep from getting our white ink turning pink on red garments or turning gray on a black garment. One of the solutions that we're going to present today is silicone. I want to make sure that we're clear on one point as it relates to silicone. The magic of silicone inks are not that they've got this incredible dye blocking chemistry in them that allows you to print on a polyester garment and have no concern that you're going to have dye migration. That is not what silicone does, okay? Silicone is not a low bleed ink. What silicone does do is cures at a much lower temperature than plastisol. So what it allows you to do is to set the ink at a lower temperature than you would generally apply today to cure plastisol. And so why is that an advantage? It's an advantage because likely this garment isn't going to release dye at 220 degrees to any degree. It's going to be releasing dye cl much closer to 300 degrees. So silicone allows us to, to cure, and I'll call it set, because Max and I will get into how the cure process works with silicone, but allows us to set the ink at a temperature lower than the garment will release dye. Therefore, dye migration will be a non-issue on a traditional polyester garment in a lot of applications. Now, there are bad polys out there where we can take what I just said and throw it out the window because it's releasing dye at 250. But generally speaking, that's where silicone really has the magic because of where it sets. Um, the set temperature for silicone, what we'll promote in our literature is about 270 degrees. I think there's a little bit of latitude in that window. When you take the, uh, the specification that comes from our uh, raw material providers, I think it converts from Celsius, uh, because these are not domestically sourced raw materials, it converts from Celsius to about 266. Uh, and most manufacturers add a little bit of wiggle room in those numbers. So I think we're really in that 260, 270 range. Our literature will say 270. I'm not advising you cure it at 260 or 250. Um, but I think likely you should do your own experimenting to figure out durability after cure. Um, so dye migration, I'm just going to brush on it. Most of you have seen it. Um, Quickly, I, I, I touched on it a bit, but, but it is one of the reasons why you're here. So let's just, just, just sort of get it out there. 
Dye migration is the process of heating up a polyester. That garment, the dyes in the garment, converting to a gas when they hit temperature X, again, not defined, that gas releases from the garment and heads north. If you lay a film of ink down over top of where that garment is releasing dye, that gas gets trapped in the ink, can't release, and then discolors the ink film. That's what we talk about when we're saying you have dye migration. That's why you have dye migration. Okay? This garment is the one that sort of changed things for us, right? A lot of us could decorate these garments with some degree of success, right? As we make, as ink manufacturers, a gray, a first down gray product that can be printed on this that will allow you to uh, really block the dye. The, 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 the gray underbase plastisols that we sell today, if you look at the paradigm of bleed resistance, a gray underbase would be the best bleed resistance in a, in a traditional plastisol you could get, by the way. Then it would be white ink. Then it would be a colored ink. Okay? So we make gray inks that can go down first if white weren't strong enough on this. So you could buy a barrier gray plastisol product, put it down instead of white, um, and likely have very good success with blocking dye on this one. So not necessarily need here, needed here. Max and I have been doing some experimenting. I'll give Max a credit for sure he deserves it, but we've also been learning that you can put that gray down on this product and cover it with a Union traditional cotton Max opaque ink and end up with a really nice polyester sort of ink combo with the gray down first to block the dye, then the Max opaque color on top to cover the gray and have a really nice polyester combination, if you will, that way. So I want to interject that here as well. If you end up walking away from this presentation believing that silicone I'm not sure on, but I want to walk away with benefits of decorating polyester, uh, you know, the, the gray barrier product with max opaque on top is also a good solution for traditional poly. Okay? This one was the game changer because now we have a sublimated blank. Uh, sublimation, this plate, this was, came off of a rolled fabric that started as white fabric and then through the process of heat transferring sublimation dyes to that roll of white fabric, there's just these huge machines, I assume that's how they're doing it, Rick at Badger, these huge machines, they're sort of pressing with heat and rolling sublimation transfers onto the white roll of fabric, converting it to this digital sublimated um, and that's called sublimation, right? Converting white polyester to an image or a graphic is sublimation, done with sublimation, dyes and heat. The challenge with these are, these release dye lower than power polyester dyes release. So now, our traditional magic silicone ink that cures at 270, I'll say the right thing, 260, 270, that can escape and get below the dye release on a traditional poly, cannot get below where these are releasing dye because these are releasing dye generally lower than 260, 270. I'll pull an arbitrary number out. I think 220 is probably a good number. Max and I did some work on garments uh, a couple of years ago where they were releasing dye 205. I don't know what the heck you're going to put on that. There isn't a plastisol around that that would uh, cure below 205. We ended up putting down that gray barrier product sometimes in two layers and we're able to fight dye that way. But, um, so now this comes out. Put silicone on this, run it through your oven at 270 degrees, you're still gonna get dye migration. So now, how do we affect sublimated blades? Well, in the, in the world and realm of silicone, we have also provided you with a black underbase. Again, that paradigm of bleed resistance, something black or gray that's provided that's identified as a bleed blocking product um, will generally have stronger bleed resistance because of the chemicals used to make it than anything else you can apply. So for sublimated garments you will be applying a black underbase to block dye from coming through. Okay? So I want to make sure in full disclosure we're, we're selling you the right materials, right products, and the right information.
If you're not a decorator of sublimated blanks, right, then general silicone printing here, I, I don't suspect you're going to see problems unless you overheat. As an example, I was at Badger several months ago, Appalachian State being printed on a pair of black shorts. I could tell by my eye those black shorts were not quite black. You can tell when things are going to die, sublimate generally, because they don't look really clean. The color of the garment doesn't look clean. Sure enough, they put gold straight to fabric, run it through, dye migrating. I put temperature tape on the garment, run it down the dryer, the oven's at 330 degrees. You lower it down to 270, dye migration problem gone. So that is how you are impacting dye migration with silicone. Okay? So let's talk a little bit about the why silicone. All right? So we pre presented the solutions and some ideas on where to apply them. So outside of dye migration, where else would a silicone uh, benefit, could benefit your company? I think one thing that I can tell you for sure is out of this group of, let's call it 30 folks spread across this region, you have hundreds of people who are screen printers in this region, yet a very small percentage are here. So what does silicone provide that may not be on the forefront of the other guys who aren't here today is differentiation. Silicone allows you to provide something that feels different, that is more flexible, that is softer, that has more stretch, that's more durable, that cures easier. All those benefits different from the other 270 folks who opted not to come here today. So in your market where you are competing likely regionally, so you're, you're printing for Mooresville High School, don't know if that really exists, and the other guy is printing for Mooresville High School, is there a benefit to you and your business to walk into Mooresville High School and go, last year I printed Plastisol for you, and, it, and here's what I presented. It was a great product. Here's an alternative. Is there a value add, right? So in marketing, there's a term value add proposition. Is there a value added proposition to your business for silicone? Does it differentiate you from the guy down the street and give you a performance and competitive advantage over the guys in your region printing for Mooresville High School? I think the answer to that is yes. Um, but again, that's for you to determine and decide. So. Going back to the why of silicone, it could provide your business an advantage over the competitors in town, albeit it could be a slight window of opportunity to win new business at accounts where you aren't selling today, because your competitors, once they learn what, how you won the business and what the chemistry was, will likely start making phone calls to try to figure it out. But silicone could open new opportunities for you that you don't have today. It could allow you to go out and sell against your competitor. So I really want to sort of hammer that idea home. Because for a guy who's been in business 24 years, been doing the same thing likely over and over, competing in that market with the guy down the street, this could be an opportunity to really set yourself apart from your competitors. So I think that's important. The other thing that we need to talk about silicone and what it brings to the table is how many of you have never had a job returned for dye migration, complaint, um, returned or had to discount a job for dye migration, migration complaint, or ink that washed off or ink that cracked? So is it safe to assume that most have seen that through your career of owning a business, right? You've seen jobs come back. So what silicone offers you here is a little bit more of a sense of security as we're dealing with dye migration, cure, ink cracking, inks that don't stretch, ink durability. Because it's my position that the silicone product, when applied appropriately and correctly, provides a very durable ink film that is chemically cured, different than what you're doing today with just heat, right? Silicone uses heat and chemicals to create the cure, called a catalyst, that gives you a very durable, wearable, 
flexible, soft, stretchy ink product. So it gives you more of a safety net to combat returns than Plastisol does today. Now, if you cure Plastisol correctly, you have all those same advantages. But likely decorating polyester, in your mind, you're a lot concerned about dye migration. You've already figured out that overheating the garment is going to create the more risk of dye migration. So probably what you're doing is turning the oven down, turning the belt speed up to try to mitigate the risk of dye migration, right? We all, we're all guilty of it. Um, the problem with that is you're likely not curing that plastisol completely and we'll continue to see ink that cracks, jobs that are returned for washing out because you are trying to balance the risk reward of providing my customer with a not a, a, a undye migrated garment um, that I can resell that was, call it six bucks, that I don't want to eat and bring back. Balancing that under cure, cure position to protect yourself against that return and probably providing in some cases garments that aren't fully cured or ink that isn't fully cured. It's a reality. One that I too uh, had to be challenged with in my career. So. Those are sort of the, the whys of why silicone should be considered and could be an option for you, okay? So I want to put that out there. From a technical aspect, uh, I'm going to let Max, um, this is impromptu, but I'm going to let Max sort of pick up for a minute here, and I'd like for Max to talk a little bit about the silicone package that we're offering as it relates to the components that you would need um, if you're referencing this sheet here, okay, Max will be referring to this sheet as he's talking a bit, but sort of what we're offering as a company, as a silicone solution, how you would buy those, how you would blend those, how the different components work. I'll have Max sort of talk about that, which will give you a break from hearing my uh, voice. Uh, chat a little bit about how that works uh, to give you, give you a little bit of background there. Basically what we did, because we've done a lot of work with Badger, is uh, these colors here. This is a, what we consider a toner to base mixing system. It's not where you have to buy like in uh, the mixing system for Plathosol. What we have done is we matched all of Badger's color palette because we did a lot of work with, the, uh, with Badger. So what we did is these are the colors that are available as uh, the toners. And what we have done is we, we make a base because what we want to do is you take the base and you mix the toner at the appropriate level to make these individual colors. And the reason we don't make pre-mixed colors is that there's, there's issues when you take organic pigments and mix them with silicone. You have a shelf stability even before you add the catalyst. That's why we're promoting it as a mixing system. The last thing we want to do is sell you guys a, a quarter or a gallon of a safety orange and use it one time and four or five months down the road. It's no good to you. So what we do is as long as you keep the components separately, you'll have an unlimited, you know, at least a good year's shelf life. So but what we've done is if you'll look at the back, this sheet here, what we have done. Created formulas for you. And what we do is you got a, a formulation guide for mix one quart and mix one gallon. So basically, if you want to mix a quart, it tells you, say, let's do the very top of the graphite toner. The graphite, you take the graphite toner at 210 grams to 774 grams of the mixing base. You mix that, then you add 49 grams of catalyst. So we've done the cat we've done the work for you far as that give you the percentage. The percentage for the catalyst is 5% by weight. Now, this leads to another thing. If you do not have a scale and you want to do silicone, you need to get a scale. We don't recommend you just eyeballing the catalyst. That is not that is that is not the way to go because if you don't get enough catalyst in there, that ink will never cure. And that's the last thing you want to happen is print a bunch of shirts because the great thing about Plastisol is what I've always learned, loved about Plastisol. If you don't cure it the first time down the oven, you can, it's a thermoplastic. What I mean by thermoplastic, it remelts. This is a thermoset. 
it doesn't remount. So you got one shot to cure. But you have to, if you have the proof amount of catalyst in it, you won't have any issues. You can take the silicone inks and mix the toners and base together. And I don't care how, how hot you run it through the oven, it will never cure. So it has to have the catalyst. So you definitely need a scale. Uh, it's definitely an investment that you, you don't have to buy a super expensive scale. You just need a scale that probably weighs to, you know, a, 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 I like to see people use scales have a tenth of a gram actually. But for something like this, you can probably get away with maybe a half gram actually. Uh, but again, if you don't need to make a quart, and if you see to the right, you want to make a gallon, you can make a gallon. There's a form of dual gallon. But if you don't need to make a quart, you want to make less, just cut everything in half. That'll make a half quart. For people doing manually, you know, if you don't need, you know, typically what I tell people in automatic, you need to have at least five, six hundred grams of ink in a screen to keep it flooded and keep it moving. But for a manual printer, I would never make a, if I had, like, you know, if I only had to do 24, 48 pieces, or even less, I would even cut it down even less than half a quart, just to mix up a small cup, use as little as possible. Now, once you add that catalyst, once you add that catalyst, in the screen, we're seeing, J.O., you're seeing six to eight hour shelf life in the screen, about the same as I'm seeing, or even in the screen, once your once your screens are, once you got it in the screen. You definitely have a day. You got a day. So, I mean, I like, you know, it's all heat related too. We actually did a test this past week. I don't know if you, did you see the guys in the lab, what they were doing? No. They actually took our white ink, and this was a good test. They actually <coughs> took the white ink and put our catalyst in it, and we put it in a screen on automatic and got the pallets really hot, just let it continuously run. <coughs> What we did is we put the white ink in a screen that had no image. So all we did was let that ink move back and forth on those hot pallets. We actually have seen competitors that their ink, their white ink will start gelling up in that screen within an hour. We were running multiple hours without ink. Because what we're doing is we're simulating just building heat to see if that ink will eventually gel up. We're not that that same ink. So if it have no image, that ink just sits there and just keeps cooking and keeps cooking. So uh, we actually had multiple hours, which makes us feel about our Longevity. Now, even if, if what we do is also, if you mix up a cord and you dip out that cord, I like to see people seal that cord and keep it by the pressure on the shelf. We're seeing even after you catalyze and you keep it sealed, you know, we've seen as long as 48 hours and it, and it will still work. So, so once you add the catalyst, it's not like adding catalyst to a nylon jacket ink. Nylon jacket inks normally when you, you if you use catalyst for nylon, you need to use it pretty quick within you know a few hours. So it's going to get, it'll get like a brick, you won't do anything with it. So, but you definitely need a scale. And what we've done is, like I said, we, we created a color palette for stock colors. That way, of and what we also have is for these colors, we actually have a cross reference to uh, Pantone. So that so each of these colors will give you you know, a, a Pantone reference, what it's close to, that way if you have to do Pantone, uh, if you have certain Pantone colors that you may have to do for a customer, they give you an idea of what it's close to. Which leads to the next option. We actually, actually, we're actually going to have a mixing system. So if you look at the very bottom of this page here, it says S S X T pig concentrates. That's basically the, pig, the pigments you'll need to carry to do PMS colors. So you can carry these, I think it's 14, you have 14 pigments, and we'll be able to mix Pantone colors for you. And you'll treat this the same way. It'd be, you know, you just want to mix up what you're going to use. Uh, also, we have gold, some metallics. Let me backtrack a little bit. With this RFU colors added as a basis, the base that you want to use when you're using the toners and uh, base, you want to use the SX0201. It says matte mixing base. That is the base you want to use, which is this base right here. And here's a toner. Right here. So what I do is I mix these two together at the appropriate amount. Mix them. And then add the catalyst. But for standard colors, for the, for the toners, you want to use the SX0201. Now if you look at the top, where it shows you your simmers, uh, shimmers, gold, and metallics. There's a different base we use. 
The reason we use a different base is because the base is more transparent, it's more, it's more clear, so which makes the metallics a lot brighter. It gives more vibrancy. And that's the SX0300 HD base. So, same percentage of catalyst when you use, when you're doing metallics, nothing different. Same mixing, you know, you need scales. There's the ratios you need, so. But that's the two systems that we're offering. Now, the only two colors that you do not have to mix is white and black. We can make pre-mix white, we make pre-mix black. Reason being, they're not organic pigments. And that's the problem you have with organic pigments, is that uh, when you take the organic pigments, and typically your organic pigments are in, in, your, are in your colors. That's the reason we don't sell those pre-mixed. Shelf life up to a year? These right here will be fine. Before you add the base, and the toners, you'll be fine. They, they'll be, they'll mean they'll, they'll be fine until a year. No you want me to wait the black blood. mixed? Yes, yeah, you should be fine. How about after you add the, the uh, catalyst? If you add you mix the white and you put the catalyst in it, still. If you keep, if you keep it sealed, we've seen forty-eight hours at least at a minimum. Yeah. yeah. So. There's a lot of variables going at That's why we kind of tell people it may, it may last a week. Once you add the catalyst. But what happens is, if it, even if it starts, if it does start thickening up, it may not have as good an adhesion because it's starting to cross a little bit. So we like to see people just go ahead and try to mix as much as they're going to use. We know that's not always possible. But say, for example, if you mix up quarter white, you can come in and you just keep it sealed, you can come in the next one and pop that lid and go right back to using So, find refrigerating it helps. We do. You know what we've seen is that you know when you when you put the catalyst in the ink, you'll you'll feel the the warmth as the catalyst is starting to work. Molecules are banging around in there doing their thing. What catalysts do, you'll feel it start to develop develop a little bit of heat. So what cold does, it sort of just slows that reaction. So we are we are aware that some who are using silicone already to decorate garments use a refrigerator or have used a refrigerator in the past. Um, even some who were using a refrigerator, what they're learning is our system, there is a com competitive system out there, by the way. We're not the only one selling silicone, and I want to touch on that. But uh, what we're finding is Max is using the, the appropriate timeline here of 48 hours of stability, but we're, we're seeing stability even in excess of 48 hours, depending on the environment. You know, we're, we've seen inks that three days later were fine, we're seeing inks that four or five days later were still usable. We, we have to do the, the right thing when we're communicating temperatures, times, uh, stability, shelf stability, pot life. You know, we really need to be careful as the manufacturer and present our recommendation. But your environment may net a different result, right? So if you're in a super hot environment, if your shop's 125 degrees in the summer, no airflow, um, it, it could be that that pot life isn't as good as 48 hours. If you're in a more stable environment, you may find that it ends up being better than 48 hours. But we'll have, we have guidelines on our technical data sheets there, which is sort of the, the recommendation from our chemist that say, here is what we would suggest. Um, and, and those guys are generally pretty conservative you know, in their estimations. Um, to sort of m minimize any risk. I know that that sometimes when you hear the idea that you're going to have to have a scale and weigh things, we lose people because they don't want to deal with the, we'll call it complexity or labor aspect of blending things together. You just want to grab ink off the shelf, swirl it around, some of you don't even probably do that, throw on the screen and print with it, right? And unfortunately, <coughs> systems like this do not lend themselves to that kind of mentality. So you're either going to have to change your mentality and sort of raise your level of professionalism in your facility or not opt into silicone because there isn't a choice of hearing what we're saying about weighing up these things in the right ratios. Um, hearing that and then leaving here and saying, well, I'm going to print silicone and not wait up. Anyway, I'll use my eyeball. You'll likely have what we'll call anomalies uh, in the process. 
that will be very painful for you in respect to failure and failure rate. So TechSource does offer a range of scales from very inexpensive, less accurate scales, but albeit it's an inexpensive scale, you get what you pay for, to very professional level scales. Um, so they range from maybe a couple hundred bucks all the way up to seven, eight hundred bucks. That said, you can get a range of scale, or you can go online and find your own scale. You know, neither one of us are really in the scale business. Um, our, our goal here is to ensure that you're weighing up things properly, accurately, so that you can take that aspect of the ink itself uh, being blended properly, take that out of the equation or risk for failure. So if you don't have a scale today, you should see your tech source sales rep and ask questions about what they offer in the range of scales. Go online, do some of your own research. We really don't care where the scale comes from. Um, but know that you will need a scale for this process. So not only is it highly encouraged, that's understating, it's required. You'll need it. Max, hit on toner. So what we're offering you here are basically a paste, a pigmented paste that you will add to that base. At, at the time of blending, bear in mind, you gotta have that scale to weigh up to put the catalyst in anyway. So adding one more addition, the toner, really isn't a huge, uh, you know, a huge request outside of, you gotta weigh it up anyway. So you'll add the toner to the base based on the ratios on the card, add the catalyst, blend them up, or blend the, the toner with the base and add the catalyst, um, and then go to print. So that, that's a requirement. We're not the only guys uh, selling silicone today, but what we are, um, selling is what we think is an easier solution in these toners. The competing product that you will find doing a Google search um, is a pigment and base system. So it's a much more complex. The reason why we did toners is we wanted to provide you with an easy way to make 1235 gold, right? That's athletic gold. I don't think anybody's going to argue 1235-ish, 130, somewhere in that range isn't athletic gold. So what you see on the back of that card are athletic colors. The athletic colors that you use today, it's, it's the same forest that your eye sees as forest. It's the same athletic gold that your eye sees as athletic gold. We did work with Badger to develop the colors because we feel like their palette did a good job of representing the athletic industry. They're selling to your customers, um, you know, anywhere your customers specify their goods, they have to be within that range. So we do provide another sheet that tells you what Pantone color our toners are most like. So as you leave here and start asking questions and want to learn um, exactly what color is represented on the back of these sheets, we can provide you with an Excel spreadsheet that says SX4291 gold is most like Pantone whatever. So that you, you have something to gauge that by. So that is available as well. All right, so we're going to break this up into another two-parter. And I'll give Max a little bit more notice this time so you can mentally prepare. Um, so I'm going to talk about cost, selling, opportunities to have more margin in your, in your business. And uh, then Max will take it away. Max will talk about printing, attributes, press setup, printing direct to fabric versus underbasing, flash times, you know, some of the technical stuff that, that goes on there. Uh, so that, that's how we'll sort of break this up. Let's talk about cost, right? Because everyone uh, that I tell, it's 200 bucks for a gallon of silicone ink, they like, what? How the heck will I ever afford a $200 gallon of ink? Uh, and I'm using that number, it's arbitrary. It's not really $200 a gallon, but I think you should prepare your mind around a $200 <coughs> gallon of ink. Um, the, the base is sold, different package sizes carry a, a bigger weight or discount. So if you're really going to get into silicone, you're, you're going to be buying five gallon pails of base anyway. Maybe you're buying quarts of the toners to blend with, 
but you're, you're going to be buying a five gallon pail of base. So that the cost of the base of the base does reduce pretty significantly when we move from a quart of base down to a five gallon pail of base. So you're probably still talking about a hundred eighty dollar gallon of ink, right? So it's an expensive proposition. I do want to tell you, or I want to ask you guys a question first. How many of you can tell me, if I give you, and I did the work here in the lab myself, so I, I know the answer. It's like an attorney, right? I'm not going to ask you something I don't know the answer to. I've got an image size. It's eight and a half image by six and a half inches, right? Square, 60% coverage. I'm putting white, low bleed plastisol down. It costs me 100 bucks a gallon. Uh, uh, polyester, right? Any idea what that image would cost me to print? Eight and a half, six and a half, 110 mesh, print flash print, down. Anybody know what that cost to print? It's crazy, isn't it? How many of you are gauging by the cost of the gallon when you buy it? You buy your white, you're looking for it to be $5 a gallon cheaper. That number needs to be relative to something, right? Um, that's a whole other thing, right? I did that Why So Many Whites a couple years ago here, and I think I opened up some eyes on that. <coughs> but uh, so that $100 gallon of ink, and that six and a half by eight and a half, 60% coverage image, will cost you eight cents. 110 mesh print, flash print of ink. Okay? Keep that number in mind. Because I'm going to. That's 180 gallon? No, no, no. That's a $100 gallon yeah, polyester white. Just a, just a plastisol that you would use today. We're going to get into the $180 gallon. Yeah. How much was it? Eight cents. Eight cents, Eight cents. Eight cents for the print flash print. So that's if the ink costs $100. Right? That's white. Yeah. So silicone ink, in the test that I did, where I weighed every single layer in between the prints, simulating the same process. So I print flash printed, 110 mesh, same screen actually, same substrate, same, same, same. The weight was identical. It was a fraction of a percent difference in weight. So to answer your question that you asked me earlier, the actual weight of silicone in the deposit, although the ink film feels thinner, the actual weight is the same as 100% as polyester white. Weight identical. Uh, it was like four, well, I don't, I don't know, I want to say this because I don't remember exactly. I think it was like 4.17 grams of 4.01 grams, something like that. I don't remember exactly what it was. But um, that print, now duplicated with silicone, is 14 cents. Okay? So the difference between using plastisol and silicone, by my math, which isn't always good, is about six cents. Right? Six cents an impression on that print. Let's assume it's a two sided print. We should. 12 cent difference in ink cost. Now, since none of you know what your ink cost is, you really shouldn't care that it's $180 a gallon, right? Because you haven't done the work to figure out what it costs you to print a garment. Um, which you should do. I mean, it does matter. Generally, where you get back to, for those who will spend the time calculating ink cost, is what the cost of the ink is relative to the sale of the garment is insignificant. Now, that's bold for an ink manufacturer to say, and it's a bit risky. Because at the end of the day, you're going to say to me, well, dude, I spent $20,000 on ink this year, and I surely don't want to pay an extra 50%, 80%, or whatever the math comes out you on ink. Well, maybe you don't, but maybe you do, right? So I'm going to stay away from the sublimated garment real quick, and I just want to talk about this regular polyester garment, that $0.08 cents and that $0.14. Cents. I'm going to use some hypotheticals here. I know there's a range. This is all general, but it's real, it's real stuff. This garment costs you six bucks. And you receive this blank, and you're going to convert it for usually one and a half times the cost, right? So let's use a hypothetical here. You paid six, you're going to resell it for nine. That's probably low, but I want to use low numbers here because I'm trying to prove a point. Do, do we all agree with that? $6 blank resell for nine is reasonable. We're going to convert it to side print, right? By the way, if you aren't using that formula, maybe it's one that should work for you. If you're converting it for $6.25, I can tell you you're losing your behind. 
because the ink's costing you 16 cents on a two-sided print. Um, that said, uh, so one and a half times is about the standard. So this is, this is man, come to you, delivered, you convert it, it's a $9 garment that you resold. Right, you got $3 worth of profit margin in this garment. Everyone believe fair? Is there a value added opportunity for silicone? That's the first question that you have to qualify. If the answer is no, why would you pay 12 cents more worth of ink to print with something and take that out of your $3 margin over a job of 300 pieces? Probably doesn't make sense to take 12 cents a piece out of our 300 pieces, right? But the question is, can this $9 garment now be a $9.50, a $10, $10.50? Is there value added or perceived value in the mind of the end user in a garment printed with silicone? I believe there is. Being an industry guy, I believe that if you lay a print down in front of a customer printed with plastisol, the way you're doing it today with the heavy polyester ink, and then lay a garment down next to that garment printed with silicone, that 100% of the time your customer is going to ask for silicone. 100%. I believe that. So then the question is, will they pay more, more for it? Notice that I'm not answering that question. You're going to have to go vet that with your customers. I believe there is perceived value in the surface, texture, stretch, durability, all of that presented with silicone ink. How much value? You'll have to test the market. I believe that $9 garment could easily have an extra 10%, right? That $9 garment's now $9.90. Well, let's call it 995 because it's printed with silicone. So now we're going to subtract out the 12 additional cents of silicone that we apply to this garment. And where does that leave you in margin? From $3 margin now to an additional, somebody needs to do the math for me because I didn't do it. Take 12 from 90, right? Are you said 9 or 95? 95 cents, yeah. So another 83 cents. So now you've just changed your margin perspective from $3 to $3.83 on that garment. If that, by percentage, doesn't excite you, then the next course I'm going to do is a business management course on how to estimate jobs and how to understand margin. Because where I come from, to add that kind of margin percent by really a minimal amount of extra risk, if you will, or cost, is a huge upside. So what I'm communicating to you is don't throw out the idea that having to buy a scale and weigh up these components to use silicone would bar you from venturing into this aspect because I believe there is a margin opportunity <coughs> applying silicone and as I started off with not only a margin opportunity but also an opportunity to be different than the guy down the street, to sell a value add, to sell something that would benefit your customer, to sell something that would benefit your business. But another point is, if you have an ink that will stretch this way and cure a lower temperature, you don't have the dot migration because you have less, less reprints, less opportunity to have failures on migration and cracking. And what happens is you have a failure and you spend that high end garment, a lot of money on a high end garment. You have to reprint it. So that's yeah. another. So I, I didn't, I, I, you know, the second part of the work that I did about calculating costs actually related to lost opportunity. So now you have to take every one of us admitting that we had jobs returned because of dye migration, cracking, failure. Now we get to take that loss and understand if we take away that loss from our business, how does that impact the bottom line of your business annually? You lose one, two, three jobs that you have to reprint, you're buying the blank again, you're losing the loss opportunity time on the press. You know, again, I don't want to get too deep into this and lose some of you, but if you take a look at 
the opportunity to not have to ever reprint a job if it's done correctly, right? To minimize that, minimize that risk. You have to take that cost of the loss you had this year and apply it towards the ink, that 12 cents per impression. And then ask, does that offset completely? So now we go back to our equation of the 83 cent opportunity, but no loss this year because we use silicone ink. Now are we back up to 95 you know, cents potentially or because we now apply that loss. Or is it even $1.15? because we aren't rebuying blanks. So is there an opportunity to put more money in your pocket because you didn't have loss using silicone? And I think those are all fair questions to, to, to ask yourself, to reflect internally, to say, yeah, when I look at my books on the year or I'm thinking back through what came back and it was related to dye migration or cracking, I actually think there could be a couple thousand dollars that I lost this year just in goods and you're not even considering what it costs you to reprint it. So I want to put it out there. I want to put it out there respectfully, and I don't want to answer those things. I want you to think about your business and determine whether or not the difference between $0.08 cents and $0.12 cents is problematic for you, or can you look beyond the difference between, I'm sorry, I said 12 and 14, the difference between $0.08 cents and 14 cents is problematic for you, or do you see an opportunity to actually make more money? Does it benefit your business to, to buy a more expensive ink product? You, you answer that. I, I don't know. The last one I want to touch on before I turn this over to Max is uh, on the sublimated blank. That, that cost was about 19 cents. So now we go from 8 cents to 19 cents. Not fair, right? Because on the polyester print, you can't put polyester ink and you can't put straight silicone ink on that garment. So don't do that. Don't say that it's 19 cents to decorate this and 8 cents to decorate my poly. Therefore, it's costing me over double because your polyester ink isn't going to work on this anyway. It's going to migrate through. So it's not fair to compare the two, which is why I did that originally, right? So what you have to do is then consider pricing this differently. Likely, this garment costs more, more, more than this garment anyway. I think the real number is about a buck, right? So you've already got, if you're doubling the cost of this garment, or one and a half times again, I'm sorry, this garment, over this garment, you've already got the margin in this garment to offset the, the, the ink cost difference in your calculation. It's already there. So because this costs more and you have to use the barrier black down, you're, it's in that calculation already. The one and a half times plus 10%, plus 50 cents, whatever it is, you're definitely covering the cost there. Okay? So that is my presentation on costing, cost analysis, and the, the, the things I want you to think about as you're, you're walking down the path of, of job estimating and pricing for silicone. So I'll step back. I'd like for Matt to talk a little bit about the intricacies of printing, palette temp, you know, flash times, flashability, uh, screen cleaning after printing, flood bars, sledding sit over, all the things that a press operator would need to know going into this venture to have to start with success. And then, then, yeah. And then once we're done, we want to print for you, but we also want you to print. So. We're going to be around for Q&A. Um, we got about 30 minutes now. We're going to be around for Q&A to answer questions individually. Um, but we also want you to have the ability, you want to feel these inks, you want to apply them yourself. Uh, Max will talk about the printability of the inks. Um, you, you're welcome to do that. We brought in enough garments, I think, where most of you could print if you wanted to. So you do have that option. We are sponsoring a lunch here, right? So um, stick around and we'll feed you as well. Nobody ever had a question. You want to, you want to just uh, availability. I mean, when is this hit? When are you ready to start selling? We're ready. You can place orders now. We have a kit that is what we're calling a toner kit, which has a base, three pigments in it, the, the ones that most of us would want, which is a, a 186 Royal and Gold Catalyst, sort of the base components. That kit's available. There's a second kit that has the barrier black 
and the barrier black base, which is that underprint for sublimation. That's another kit. Um, so we do have these kits available. We'll get that data to TechSource. Ronnie has it now. Okay, Ronnie has it. Okay, perfect. So those kits are available. I think they're a couple hundred bucks for the toner kit. And then the, the other kit is under a hundred bucks, uh, maybe 50 bucks or something. But um, the products are being made. They're being sold in the market today. We're done with beta. We're ready to rock and roll. We have inventory on some of the products. TechSource has inventory on the products already. We're ready to go. I don't know price. Yeah, price is in your system. So, yeah, we're ready to go. Okay. Inevitably, you get the question about using silicone ink. Um, can I run it through high mesh? Can I, you know, print four color process with it? Can I, you know, you have to qualify the ink. And, and in your mind, it's really an athletic application ink. It does not work well on 100% cotton t-shirts. It's not designed for fiber matting, nor does it fiber mat well. In fact, in my experience, what I've seen with fibers is it almost seems to amplify fibers. So we aren't, we aren't really promoting silicone as the albeit for all applications, including all of your cotton goods and your blended goods. It's really an athletic ink. There's no particle size issue with it running through high mesh. That said, it's best suited for vector art block kind of artwork. It's best suited for athletic substrates. It's best suited for athletic artwork. Generally, that's where it, it, its sweet spot is in, in a performance uh, standpoint. Um, smooth polyesters. We do know that some customers, and don't chuckle, but some customers may actually iron with a hand home iron steam and sort of iron fibers down smooth on nappy material. So the hypothetical here, we've got Mooresville High School and we're printing for their athletic jerseys, replica jerseys for the football team and t-shirts and sweatshirts and this and that. We want them all to look and feel the same. How do you do that? If it's not going to look great on cotton, you can iron those fibers down. You can transfer the cotton tees with the Teflon sheet and mat those fibers down. There are ways to do it. It just, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want you to leave here and think, man, I'm switching everything to silicone. It sounds like the perfect solution. I don't have to worry about cure anymore and I don't have to worry about, you know, there's still some complexities and there are still some areas where it's probably not the best choice. Um, there are workarounds for those fuzzy, nappy cotton tees. That said, it's great for athletic printing. It's great for 86 to 110 mesh. Uh, it's great for your uh, team, uh, for durability, for maybe some... Uh, Swim caps, wetsuits, yeah. stuff like that, anything stretchy. Yep. Uh, slip fibers, yes, absolutely. And you talked just about um, flashing it in between having your platform warm enough, flashing it, yes, and then you put your second coat on. And then you get the curing process. The curing process, yes. If you're only doing two color design, then that's fine. But the reason I suggested getting your pilots warmer is called the silicone ink on a cold palette. So if you, you took the silicone ink and you printed it back here, and you didn't pre-hit your pilots, it may flash it. 12, 15 seconds. That's about how long before it gets dry the customer can print it. But getting heat in the pallet, what it does is it gets get a lot of warmth in that pallet, comes through the garment, so you don't have to flash it, flash it as long as you have a warm pallet. It ain't going flash back. Which helps you with speed. Helps you because it's going to help, just helps you be more efficient and not have to use so much. It's a good SOP, right? Standard operating procedure or practice to warm your pallets up before you start production anyway. For those of you who have a temperature gun, I sort of like 125 to 130 as a good temperature to warm my pallets up to. Of course, if I'm on some you know, wooden pallets, some may not take that much heat, but I like a nice warm 125 degree pallet, uh, which will allow the silicone to flash much faster, but it allows plastisol to flash faster also. So there's nothing wrong with heating up your platens before you start running to get good operating temperature before you start running. And then to answer the question about cure, you know, we're looking for that. We'll call it 270 degrees in the oven. We talked on those temperature tapes, which I like, that mid-range temperature tape. I think it sort of starts around 260, 270, goes up to 320, 330. I like that tape for this application. Works well. Um, 
but you're really looking at sort of a sustained temperature in that 260, 270 range, enough to get the ink up to that range and spitting out the back. What, about 90% of the cure happens in the oven. The other 10% is going to take about 24 hours. So with silicone, you really want to wait 24 hours before you wash. Unlike plastisol, where once it's cooled, it's set, it's ready to go. You do want to wait 24 hours to, to ensure that the catalyst has had time to do its work and finish itself. Is there a shelf life on the base? Not really. Yeah, not really on the base. Uh, you know, again, you, you, you not blending. Our original plan, what we really wanted to do here was sell you 1235 gold, have you had catalyst and go. Organic pigments don't allow us to do that. Um, so I won't say it was our original plan, it was our original thought as we were developing silicone. And then once we learned we couldn't do that, um, it put us back into this component position. That said, blending the pigment in with the base, you still have the risk of some de uh, degradation degradation happening in that process, so you want to be cautious to blend as you need it. You don't need to make the gold, then put it on your shelf and say, I'll just catalyze it next month when I'm going to use it. You need to make it as you need it. Things like white, you know, silicone is going to be tough to dabble in because you have, you create a lot more waste dabbling in silicone than you will if you're regularly using silicone. So you really need to decide you're going to get into silicone, dabble with the kits, play around with it, print it here, decide if you like it, and then I'd probably decide I'm going to make a wholesale change and start running silicone on my athletic printing. Because you'll really minimize the exposure for waste if you're using it every day or every other day. Do you see any uh, problem with the, uh, like the heat issue? But you don't have any problems with the bubbling of silicone when it goes through, or if it goes through just a little bit too hot? No. And you shouldn't have that with plastisol. Generally, you know, with an electric oven, generally if you see that, your, your heat source is way too close to the carbon. You need to back that off a bit. Using a lowly white, I'm saying that more of a lowly white, that's definitely So what I think we want to do, lunch is here, and I don't want it to get cold. So because there's so many of us, we can't all print it once anyway. So let's just do this. Max and I and Dave will move over to the press. I think I'll make myself available for individual questions. So I'll hang around up here. Max and Dave will work with you guys printing. We should enjoy lunch together. We should enjoy conversation. I may sort of jump in and out of answering questions personally or address the group with my response because it may be something I feel you all need to hear and I forgot to tell you. Uh, so we'll just take the next, uh, you know, next hour or so, uh, and ju let's just sort of mingle, let's do some printing, let's eat lunch. I think Robert may have something to say here. Uh, by the way, the, Robert Boland is the uh, the owner of TechSource, and we appreciate Robert putting this on for us and supporting us. Glad you guys showed up. I hope, I hope they're doing a good job. If they're not, we can get rid of them and bring some more people in. That's right. Bring the triangle guy in, right? <laughs> there you no, go. They, they're good guys. Uh, we got quite a few different pizzas. If, you, if someone's a vegetarian, the last two pizzas on the end, One's a Bianca, one's a cheese. Uh, we have a porcosaurus. I know you're not going to know what this is when you go over there and look at it. It is smoked pork, pulled, and we make a pizza out of it. We have quite a few different pizzas, different styles and varieties. So, and there's a lot of it. So fill up. Just come down, down the line and grab you a piece and move on. We don't want you to sit there and eat hanging over the pizza. So grab it and go sit down. Or, Go outside or go home or where are you going to go eat? Are there any more questions that you guys want to ask about the presentation that you feel like the group needs to benefit from your question before we move on? Is there a dwell time? If, curing is so subjective. I just spent 15 minutes talking about cure with these fine folks. What I like is dwell time, generally speaking, for what we do. 60 seconds in the oven. Can it be 45? Yes. Don't think it should be 30. Um, but uh, so generally, I like 60 seconds. I don't want to backtrack on that. Could be 45. 60 seconds at 270 or 67 yeah. in the tunnel? In the tunnel with an oven that will allow that garment to get up to set temp and maintain for 12 to 15 seconds. General rule.
Um, I'm not aware of a silicone puff. Uh, I don't know if the chemistry would allow it. The problem with the problem with puff, I'll say what you could do is the, 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 the expand cells which use two puffs typically will kick off around 300 to 320 degrees Fahrenheit. If there's an option to find a pure silicone of that temperature, but if they call this migration, which could. But the key to be if we had an expand cell agent that would kick off at a lower temperature. We may, but I don't know how is probably my biggest problem. So you still want to cure in that low temp, but you'd like to have a puff. We'd have to look at the technology for us. We had an experiment. It has to be experimented. But you may be able to print through a, a capillary film, or as my or British friends say, capillary film, at uh, you know, 100 to 200 micron, and get a nice stencil thickness without puff. So there could be a solution for you that's not puff, that would still provide a heavier, thicker print than what you would get with a regular screen 86 coated traditional. So capillary film could be the option. I just like the way that <laughs> rolls off the tub so much better than capillary. But that is not the key to have a blow agent. Some of you want to go ahead and start grabbing some pizza and go back. I'm going to be ready.